Will you turn with me to Luke chapter 2? Luke chapter 2, and we'll be picking up in verse 25. Be forewarned. You will walk away today with more questions than answers. And that's on purpose. Uh, we want Antony to keep it, you know, get his keep. So come back tonight and ask him lots of questions. We've been, for the last four weeks, looking at the Torah from a meditative perspective. That is in contrast to a historical perspective, or a theological perspective, or a communal perspective. What is meant by meditative perspective is coming to scripture and taking our time and seeing the intricate design patterns that are in the word. Not reading into scripture, but realizing that scripture is formatted and fabricated in such a way that it's echoing one story that ultimately culminates in the life of Christ. The origin of that story begins in Genesis. And I have to agree with several scholars that Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 form the foundation for the entire Bible. The themes that are in these three chapters will be played out and will be referred to and twisted in certain ways all throughout the Bible that ultimately lead to Christ. Luke chapter 2, verse 25, gives us a fantastic little story. Everyone here, I'm sure, has heard of the Bible study that Jesus gave on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 16, post-resurrection. Man, to be in that Bible study where you see two fellow travelers walking down the road, Jesus comes, and then we read that beginning with the Moses and the prophets, he began to teach them how they reflected him. Him. To be in that Bible study where Jesus is saying, yeah, you know Moses? That was actually talking about me. David? That was a reflection of me. The Psalms? Guess who they were talking about? Well, that's at the end of Luke. It's interesting that bracketing the beginning of Luke, Luke chapter 2, verse 25, we read the story. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the comfort of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus, to carry out for him the custom of the law. Then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Master, you are releasing your slave in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon, this aged saint who was living his life before Christ, is here holding Jesus eight days old, and all he had was the Hebrew Bible. And he had expectation of the coming Messiah. Where did he get this understanding? Where did he get this hope? of Israel. The passage that he quotes in verse 32 is actually a reference to Isaiah. You see that same theme in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 51, and Isaiah 60. He's reading his Hebrew Bible and he's seeing this, this unraveling theme 
that ultimately is fulfilled in Jesus. Interesting, Jesus is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Yeshua, which is cousin to Yeshua, Joshua. Interesting. How did Simeon, how did Nathaniel and John, and how did Paul understand their Bible? You remember in John, Nathaniel sitting under the tree just thinking, and then Jesus tells him, hey, by the way, angels coming up and down upon the Son of Man. That's what you're going to see. What was Nathaniel reflecting upon in the Hebrew Bible that would lead him to think of Jesus as the Messiah? Well, today we're going to see three pictures of how Genesis chapter 3 forms the foundation for three different vignettes throughout the Old Testament, all touching on the same themes. The first vignette is the book of Josh, uh, Judges. Will you turn with me to Judges chapter 4? I briefly touched on this last week, and as I was preparing for this week, I was just looking at this, and I said, you know what? This is just too deep. I can't brush over this. I want to go into it with a little bit more detail. Judges. I'm sure that you guys have all heard of these fictional stories where it's called multiverses and reverse multiverses. They're really big in the DC comic universe where the good guys become the bad guys and the bad guys become the good guys and everything's twisted. The book of Judges is like that. Every quote unquote good guy you meet is not a good guy. Every good event that happens in Judges you begin to realize is tainted. Everything that seems to be working its way into something good is actually not. And as the book of Judges progresses, you see two things happening. The strength of the judges or deliverers that are elected by God becomes stronger and stronger and stronger, and their violence becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as the book progresses. Judges, chapter 4, and Judges chapter 9, interestingly enough, form a bracket around the center of the book. The book seems to be revolving around Gideon. Gideon is the focal point for the entire book. Taking a broad eye look, I want you to notice something. Around the story of Gideon, before Gideon and after Gideon, there are two parallel stories. What are they? The parallel stories involve two women who kill two bad guys in the same way by crushing their head, by striking their head. This is not an accident. This is drawing from Genesis. Judges chapter 4, beginning in verse 17, we read this. Now Sisera, who previously we hear is a general of an army that is coming to attack Israel. Now Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Eber, the Canaanite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Eber, the Canaanite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my master, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. And he turned aside to her into her tent, and she covered him with a rug. Then he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink, then she covered him. And he said to her, Stand in the doorway of the tent, and it shall, uh, and it shall be if anyone comes and asks of you and says, is there a man here that you shall say no? Then Jael, Eber's wife, took a tent peg and placed a hammer in her hand and went secretly to him and drove the peg into his temple 
and it went through into the ground, for he was sound asleep and exhausted, so he died. As you come and look at the details of the story, the Hebrew scholar Robert Atler has this phrase that he uses, the economy of detail that the narrators use. There are certain passages in the Hebrew Bible that you read and they are just so detailed. And then there are other portions of scripture that as you read over it, so much takes place in just one verse. Atler says, that's on purpose. When you see details there, don't rush over them. Notice what the narrator is trying to draw you as the reader into. There's a couple of things that I want you to see here. The first is the Kenite. Kenite. The interesting thing about the tribe, the name Kenite, is that the root word in Hebrew for Kenite is Cain, the same word for Cain. It is of the tribe of Cain, somehow associated with Cain, that we read about a woman named Jael. Interesting. Where does Jael reside, her and her husband? In tents. What do we read about Cain's great, 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 great descendant, Jubal? He is the father of all those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Genesis chapter 4. Wait a minute. Somehow, the line that is possessing villains is here raised up as a hero. This is interesting. As you look further into the story, you begin to see parallels with Genesis. What are they? The first thing is this. Notice how Jael comes into the tent, verse 21 secretly. That is the same word in Hebrew that is used for Ruth as she snuck into the tent to Boaz, David as he came and snuck in and took a side of Saul's um, cloak, and it's also used to describe the dark crafts of the magicians in Egypt that Moses had to fight against. That word is used only seven times, secretly, connivingly. Is that, is that on purpose? You betcha. What else happens? She draws Sisera in and says, hey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be safe. Don't worry. Sisera says, I want water. And what does she give him? Milk. Deception is all throughout the story. And what ends up happening at the end she kills Sisera by striking his head. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Why is the story so twisted up? Because as the reader, when you read Genesis 3, 15, your expectation is the seed of the woman is going to come and crush the head. And he... He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. So as you come to Judges, you're thinking of that, but you're realizing something's off. The details are there, but they're not really fitting. Why? That right there is the whole theme of the book of Judges. It's things are going to connect, but then they're not. Judges are supposed to come and rule, but then they're not ruling. Well, as you proceed through the book of Judges, we're introduced to this judge named Gideon. Here's what is interesting. If you turn with me to Judges chapter 8, verse 22. Judges chapter 8, verse 22. We read the end of Gideon's life. Gideon, that judge who was a coward, that God comes and introduces himself and says, you man of valor. And Gideon says, you got the wrong guy. 
the adventure with the 300 men is done, the enemy has been defeated, the Midianites have been crushed, and this is at the end of Gideon's life. Judges chapter 8, verse 22. Look at what it says. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, also your son's son, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. Yahweh shall rule over you. Yet Gideon said to them, I would make one request of you, that each of you give me an earring from his spoil. For they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Whoa, that's interesting. And they said, we will surely give them. So they spread out a garment, and every one of them threw an earring there from his spoil. And the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornament of the pendants and the purple robes which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the neck bands that were on their camels' necks. Verse 27. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and placed it in his city, Ophrah. Oh, if the story had ended there. Genesis chapter 3 is always drawing the reader to the reality of a choice that is before you. The good or the bad. The good in Hebrew is tov. The bad in Hebrew is ra. Tov and ra. Keep that in mind because that's going to play as we go to our third vignette. Right now we're still in our first vignette. Gideon gets this gold, makes an ephod, verse 27, and all Israel played the harlot with it there so that it became a snare to Gideon and his household. Here's another twist in the story. Previously, we had seen that the snare was external to the person. Temptation came upon them. It was something that happened to the character, whether it was Eve or Cain, something came upon them. Here, the twist comes that Gideon himself ensnared himself. The choice was before Gideon. You see, ask Antony how to explain this for you, but Genesis ends very interestingly what tribe out of the 12 does Jesus come from? The tribe of Judah. We all see the king is coming from Judah. The way that Genesis ends is that Judah is not the promised exalted one. Who is the promised exalted one? Who is the favorite of Jacob? To whom did Jacob give his blessing? As you're tracking through the story, Abraham gives his blessing to Isaac. Isaac gives his blessing to Jacob. Jacob gives his blessing to Manasseh and Ephraim. As you follow Genesis, the chosen line is Manasseh and Ephraim. Gideon is of the tribe of Manasseh. Gideon here had the opportunity to be the chosen of God. And yet, what does he do? Ensnares himself. We're right back to Genesis. Well, Gideon dies, and then we're introduced to one of his sons. We read that he has, that Gideon has 70 legitimate sons, but there is one son that is not legitimate. His name is Abimelech. Abimelech. In Hebrew, it's Ahimelech. Why is that important? Ahi means father. Melech means king. Ahi is my father. Melech is king. So when you put it together, Gideon named his son, who was illegitimate, my father is king. Interesting, because when Gideon was given the opportunity to be king, what did Gideon say? No, 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 I, I don't want to be king, I don't want to be king. 
his intention as he names his son, I actually do want to be king. This dupliciousness that's happening here. Well, it's important to get these details beginning in Judges chapter 9. Abimelech, Ahimelech, has 70 brothers. What does he do to his 70 brothers in order for him to assume and usurp the authority of Israel? He kills all 70 brothers. Wow, that's brutal. On one stone, we read, he kills them all. Judges chapter 9, verse 50, tells us something interesting. Judges chapter 9, verse 50. At the height of Abimelech's ascension to the throne, the destruction of anyone that would oppose him, Judges chapter 9, verse 50, you read something interesting. Abimelech has just destroyed a city of Shechem, and in his rage, he's going to another city, a neighboring city named Tebez. Verse 50, then Abimelech went to Tebez, and he camped against Tebez and captured it. And there was a strong tower in the center of the city, and all the men and women with all the lords of the city fled there and shut themselves in, and they went in on the roof of the tower. So Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it, approached the entrance to the tower to burn it with fire. But a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head, and she smashed his skull. That is not an accident. As you're reading this, a woman will, who kills a usurper, the rabbit hole goes even deeper. You see, Abimelech, 70 brothers, who else in Genesis do we know of that sounds like Abimelech, sounds like Abimelech, and says something about 70 and usurps power upon himself? Genesis chapter 4, you and I are introduced to an individual by the name of Lamech. Scholars have seen his name, Lamech, is actually Melech, spelled backwards. Scholars look at Lamech as a backward king, as a king who does everything kind of devious. And what does he do? The first thing he does is that he usurps God's model for marriage. Man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Lamech is the first one to marry two women. Furthermore, Lamech assumes upon himself something that God had given to Cain. Do you remember the story? Lamech says, if Cain will be avenged seven times... I will be avenged 70 times 7. These themes, these themes are not an accident. Well, the rabbit hole goes even deeper. That's vignette number one, Judges. This kind of dark, twisted, bloody book where all the good guys are actually bad where the highlights of things being good actually turn out bad. The book of Judges ends with, in those days, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It's this microcosm of bad that's happening where there's a need for order. Um, you know, growing up, and I would look at Samson. Samson was my hero. I mean, what little kid does not love this ruthless, buff, strong guy? And then the more that I read about Samson, the more I realized, oh my gosh, this guy was actually really bad. He was a womanizer. He was an adulterer. He didn't care about his wives. He was, he was a massive murderer. He was a violent man. Wow, okay. Never meet your heroes, right? Well, vignette number one, Judges. Gideon, the center of the book, bracketed by two stories of women 
killing men by injuring, crushing their head. Vignette number two. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Samuel chapter 17. When I discovered this, I had one of these like, whoa moments. These are not here reading into the story. This is deliberately drafted. I remember one of um, our fellow students in seminary, when I showed him this, he said, no, 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 George, this, this can't be, this can't be. And I said, look into it and tell me, tell me how it can't be. I'm still awaiting a response, mind you. 1 Samuel 17, you know the story, David and Goliath. David and Goliath is not the story of how you can slaughter the giants in your life. That's not the point of this story. There's something deeper in the message of the story written in the details of the story. 1 Samuel 17 verse 1 says, Now the Philistines gathered their camps for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and they camped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. But Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and arranged themselves for battle to meet the Philistines. Now the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the camps of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, and the weight of that scale armor was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. Are you noticing a description constantly jumping out at you? What is it? George, there's a lot of bronze going on over here. That's on purpose. Here's why. The word bronze in Hebrew is nehoshet. Nehoshet. Do you want to guess what its root word is? Nahash. You're like, I, I was going to say that, George. Well, what is Nahash? You guessed it. It's the same word for serpent. Notice in verse 5 the details of his armor. And he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor. The word there is kaseketseth. Kaseketseth occurs eight times in the Bible. Seven of those times is in reference to scales of fish or serpents. This is the only time that it appears in armor form. Can you see the story threading itself from Genesis? Here is an enemy who the writer wants to associate with the serpent, who the writer, the narrator, wants to tell you, and also he has scaly armor. Well, there's something that happens that's really interesting. Look in verse 38. You know the story of David and Goliath. David comes, presents the challenge. Nobody in Israel is willing to answer him. Little shepherd boy David comes. He finds out and he says, who is that guy? I'll take him on. Everyone laughs at him. David says, for the righteousness of our God, I will take him on. Who is he to blaspheme our God? Interesting. Who is he to blaspheme our God? Saul, at this point, takes David and says, okay, but let me put my armor upon you. 
What does Saul's armor look like? Verse 38, 1 Samuel 17, verse 38. Then Saul clothed David with his robes and put a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with his armor. You know the rest of the story. What did David do with that armor? He said, it's too big for me. It doesn't fit. I can't wear that. Anything associated with serpent, serpent serpent-esque themes are removed from David the hero. How does David conquer this enemy? By the power of God, through a stone and through a stick. That's it. No help, no alien help to him conquering this enemy. Well, the story goes even deeper. How does Goliath die? Look in verse 48. Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. Verse 49. And David sent his hand down into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Then David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and he struck the Philistine and put him to death But there was no sword in David's hand. I love this picture that the narrator puts. There's no sword. So what does David do? Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and put him to death and cut off his head with it. Reader, what are you being reminded of? This is Genesis 315. This is all an echo of those themes right there. I love this picture because at the end of this chapter, at the end of chapter 17, when David gets called over to Saul, <laughs> Saul uh, David is uh, walking around with Goliath's head. You just see this young little kid just walking around with the giant's head. And he won't let it go. I mean, he's going to go stand before the king. And what does the little kid do? He's still with the head. He's the giant slayer. Here is David's opportunity to be the seed. Here is David's opportunity to be the one who delivers Israel, who strikes the blow to the serpent. Is that what happens, though? Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Man, if only David had died there, the story would have been fantastic. The the giant slayer who delivered Israel from the bad guy, he saved it. He's the seed. Unfortunately, that's not the end of David's story. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. We read the sad portion of David's life. This is David is, is now king, the shepherd boy, is now a man. His enemies, Saul, is dead. He's living in safety. 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. Now it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now, verse 2, when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And she, the woman, was very beautiful in appearance. The translation here is actually a little 
little off. In Hebrew, when you read, the woman was very beautiful in appearance. The Hebrew is, the woman was very good. Or in Hebrew, tov in appearance. Where do you and I read about tov and appearance? Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. And out of the ground Yahweh God caused to grow every tree that is desirable. You guessed it. Same Hebrew word. In appearance and good tov for food. Here is David's moment to choose. Will I honor God? Or will I do what seems natural to me? Notice how the narrator, in describing this woman, is neutral in terms of what is happening. Just like the narrator in Genesis is neutral in the way that the trees that God creates, what's happening there? God is a God of beauty. One of the things that I love, that I love about our God is that our God focuses on the details. He loves beauty. Our God is a God who is mesmerized with aesthetics. Trees were formed that were beautiful. Women bear this beautiful gift from God in being beautiful. There is just something natural about femininity that adorns womanhood. It's beautiful. You try to fit that onto a man, and it's just off. What is mankind? What is masculinity? It is rough. It is rugged. It is part of the field. It is adventurous. It is dangerous. It is not to say that women can't be that, but those things come off differently when a woman does it. My wife and I love to talk about how things can be done femininely and how things can be done masculinely. When a chef is a chef, he does things. He'll present a beautiful plate, but when it's, when it's a guy, there's a touch of masculinity in that. It's delicate. It's beautiful, but it's masculine. When a female chef cooks, her plate is different. These are not accidents, and these are not cultural mistakes, cultural appropriations. They are inherent in God's design for womanhood and manhood. The narrator here, speaking of this woman, says, hey, I'm not going to take away the fact that she's beautiful. Plain and simple, she's beautiful. Temptation is temptation because that which you are tempted towards, it it's, has its luster. That's not an accident. What happens is the decision that needs to be made. Will you accede to that which is contrary to God's word? Or will you honor God and say, despite the fact that that is tempting, I won't submit myself to that. That decision was before David. That decision is before you and me constantly. But let's keep going on with the story. You know what happens. David accedes to this temptation. He sees the good, the beautiful in the woman, and he takes her for himself. You know the rest of the story. The woman is married. Her husband is actually one of David's officers. David takes him, tries to hide his sin because the woman ends up being pregnant. When he can't, he tells Joab, his commander, put her husband in the front line and make sure that he dies. David, notice these little things, David 
alters God's design for marriage. Interesting. David also decides to go against what God says and usurp upon himself life and death over a man. George, you're making this up. Look with me further on in the chapter in verse 19. The woman's husband, Uriah, has been killed, and Joab is going to give David a report. And notice what Joab adds in his report. Verse 19. And he commanded the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling all the events of the war to the king, and if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you why did you approach the city to fight did you not know that they would shoot from the wall who struck down abimelech the king of jerubbesheth did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so he died at tebez why did you approach the wall when then you shall say your servant uriah the Hittite is dead also. Do you notice the linkage? These are not an accident. What did Abimelech do? He assumed upon himself the ability to alter and change the order of authority. What did David do here? Just like Abimelech and just like Lamech. I will change what God has said is wrong, I will make good, and what is good, I will make wrong. This is not an accident. David had an opportunity to do right, and instead, what does he do? He chooses bad. Vignette number three. So David, who could have been the chosen seed, who could have been the one to, to fulfill Genesis 3.15, fails. Well, what about his son, Solomon? Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon has come to the throne at this point. Solomon is the second son that David and Bathsheba had. Solomon is chosen to be king by God. And you and I are given intricate details about Solomon's prayer to God. And I want to draw your attention to something that Solomon says to the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 6. Then Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your slave David, my father, according to how he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. So now, O Yahweh my God, you have made your slave king in place of my father David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your slave is in the midst of your people which you have chosen, a numerous people, who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your slave a listening heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this glorious people of yours? Did you know that there is only one other place where that phrase, good and evil, in Hebrew, tov and rav, actually happens? In Genesis. Here, Solomon has the opportunity to be the second Adam. 
Here, Solomon has the opportunity to be the one who loves God, who honors God, who puts himself and submits to the word of God. There's so much. The, the, the details here are so profound. The late scholar, John Stellhammer, had this theory that the more that I study, the more that I interact with commentaries, I got to admit that maybe he was right. What he believed is that the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, held all of the theological truth that the rest of the Hebrew Bible was a commentary of. And at the center of the five books, you have Genesis. And at the very core of Genesis, you have Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. And Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 form the foundation to the books of Moses, which are actually all commenting by the rest of the Hebrew Bible. The rest of the Hebrew Bible playing with the same exact themes. And I'm convinced of this. Solomon here had the opportunity to pick up what Adam lost. Notice also that the knowledge of good and evil, it's not that God did not want Adam and Eve to have knowledge. Um, a fantastic work, a theological work by the Dutch theologian um, Herman Bavink. He draws on Genesis chapter 3 and he says something very interesting. He says, when you look at Genesis 3, Adam and Eve were not infantile, ignorant people. They were knowledgeable people. They had capacity. They had skill. How else would you know how to till the ground? How else would you know to name animals? What was in question here is having knowledge the right way or having knowledge the wrong way. You could go through life gaining knowledge, tov and rav, from God's perspective, or you can go and decide to do it from your perspective. The option is before you. Here, Solomon is saying, I want to do that, but I want to learn from you, Lord. Man, oh, that Solomon had died at this point. Then he could have been the seed, right? But you and I know the rest of the story. Flip over a couple chapters to 1 Kings chapter 9. 1 Kings chapter 9. What we read in 1 Kings chapter 3 is the first interaction that Solomon has with God. In this interaction, Solomon is as the new Adam. 1 Kings chapter 9 is the second time that God comes to Solomon. And notice what God puts before Solomon. Now it happened, verse 1, 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1, now it happened when Solomon had completed building the house of Yahweh and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to do, that Yahweh appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And Yahweh said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication which you have made before me. I have set apart as holy this house which you have built by putting my name there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, here we go. Here's the option. Here's the choice. If you will walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded you and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, just as I promised to your father David, saying, you shall not have a man cut off from the throne of Israel. But, 
verse 6. If you or your sons indeed turn away from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have given before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and the house which I have set apart as holy for my name. I will cast out of my presence, so Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. There is Solomon's choice. God is once again, you have this opportunity, life or death, obedience or disobedience, blessing or curse. Solomon, it's before you. Well, 1 Kings chapter 10, we're introduced to the queen of Bathsheba. Interesting that the narrator wants to bring her in. She doesn't really form any sort of structure, obvious structure to the story. Why is she brought in? It's not a coincidence. She's supposed to be a new Eve. There's Solomon. There's the Queen Bathsheba seeking wisdom, coming to Solomon for guidance, a queen equal to a king, Genesis, Eden. What's more, when you look at the end of 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27, you read something interesting. The king, Solomon, also made silver as plentiful as stones in Jerusalem. And he made cedars as plentiful as sycamore trees that are in the Shephelah. Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Kui. The king's merchants uh, procured them from Kui for a price. The chariot was imported from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150, and by the same means they exported them to all the kings of the Hivites and to the kings of Aram. What's happening there? Jerusalem becomes a point of distribution. Jerusalem becomes this point of blessing to all these nations around them. Is that a coincidence? It's similar to what's happening, or what happened in Genesis. You read also in this chapter that Solomon brought precious stones. There were precious stones in Jerusalem. Gold was everywhere. This is a majestic city. Solomon, the new Adam, that's uh, the Queen of Sheba, the new Eve. Jerusalem, the new Eden, it's all there. The nations getting blessed in the same way that water ran from Eden to all these other nations and kingdoms, Solomon is giving forth wealth to other nations. I mean, this is amazing. Let's just camp right here, right? Fortunately, 1 Kings chapter 10 is followed by 1 Kings chapter 11. The option that Solomon had before you is blessing or curse, good or evil, what does Solomon choose? After the pinnacle of the blessing that he was, look at how chapter 11 begins. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which Yahweh had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not go along with them, nor shall they go along with you, for they will surely turn your heart after their gods. That's exactly what they did. In verse 4, now it happened at the time that Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to Yahweh his God, as the heart of David his father had been. The demise of Solomon, the potential, what could have been, 
what should have been, what would have been. And Solomon drops it. Thanks be to God that one greater than Solomon came who honored the word of God faithfully, who decided to say, I will learn good and evil according to God's way. I will do what every preceding potential seed could not do. It's no accident that Jesus said, and now one greater than Solomon is here. Christ, our mediator and our redeemer. I want to draw your attentions to two more passages, and then we're done. Our beloved linguist, Jackie, read for us this morning Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 is this kaleidoscope of themes throughout the Old Testament. In here, you have David, Joshua, Moses, the Levitical priesthood. You have so many themes coming in here, and you know what else is at the bottom and core of this theme? If you said Genesis, you'd be right. Genesis, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Notice how the author of Hebrews is tying in creation, seventh-day rest, Shabbat, the priesthood. All of these themes are being brought in, and at the end, look at the detail that he brings forward. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are uncovered and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we have an account to give. What is that drawing your attention to? Genesis chapter 2 at the end. Man and wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. What happened after Adam and Eve had gotten expelled from the garden? God put a cherubim with a sword that would forbid man from entering to take from the tree of life. But look at what the writer of Hebrew encourages you and me to do. What Adam and Eve were forbidden, could not do, because they would die. Look at what the writer of Hebrews is telling you and me to do. Verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Little footnote here. Ask Anthony this. But Eden was geographically set in the same way that the temple in Jerusalem was set. The same layout for Eden is actually the same layout for the Solomonic temple. So it's no surprise that the writer of Hebrews is talking about high priesthood. The Holy of Holies is where the tree of life would have been at. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us take hold of our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What Adam and Eve could not have, you and I now can have 
a glimpse of. You and I will not have physical, eternal life yet, but you and I can have the appetizer, the first fruits. We can experience the beginning of eternal life before the throne and presence of God. Here's what's beautiful. How do we enter? How do we go into the Holy of Holies? How do we go and enter to take of this life? What was forbidding Adam and Eve from entering and going back into the garden? A sword. Verse 12. What is the sword? The word of God. How will you and I enter into life? By engaging in the word of God. By falling in love with whom the word of God is pointing us towards. Christ. It is all of him. Last passage. We end where we began this entire adventure. Psalms, chapter 1. We started our adventure by looking at the Torah as meditative literature. Now with this kaleidoscope of details and the intricacy of how the Bible, the Hebrew Bible is written, Look with me in verses 1, 2, and 3. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh. And in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and it, whatever he does, he prospers. Psalms 1, this is a quote from two scholars, Psalms 1 stands like a Levitical gatekeeper, warning the wicked to proceed no further. Just as one must reject profane and wicked conduct to enter the holy area, so one must reject wicked companions to pray the sacred psalms. In order for you to get to Psalm 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., you must first go through Psalms 1. Psalms 1 is about the Word of God. It is as you and I enter through the Word of God, into the Word of God, fall in love with the Word of God, that you and I will receive the blessings of the Word of God, which is Christ, our Redeemer and our Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth, the beauty, the detail the life that is in your word. It is so because it leads us to you. I ask, Father, that you would help us to fall in love with your word because in learning of it and knowing of it, we encounter you. Spirit, walk with us. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us our trespasses. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for these leaders. Thank you for these souls, Lord. We love you, and in your precious name we say, amen.